again. Well, thanks to the organisers for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, we're here today to talk about 3D icons Ireland and um, how we've been taking 3D data, which we've gathered from a European project, and moving forward to maximise its potential. Uh, this is a collaborative work. Um, a lot of people involved. <coughs> the authors are my colleagues in the Discovery Programme. And this is the structure of what I want to talk about today. I want to have a look at what we did with 3D Icons, the EU project, which was um, run by uh, Franklin Nicolucci, who's, I think he's left now, um, probably before he saw me talk about the project. Um, and then look at how we've gone beyond that, how at the Discovery Programme we developed our own website, 3D Icons Ireland, and that was then the catalyst, I think, for um, some really interesting developments through education, uh, tourism, uh, commercialization, I put the question mark there, and a little bit like the previous speaker, maybe it should be an exclamation mark, maybe that's what we really should be trying to do with the data, <laughs> and academic research. I'm going to talk a little bit about 3D Icons first of all. 3D Icons was a three year project which was about digitizing the iconic um, archaeology and architectural sites of, of, of Europe uh, with a view to getting 3D data into Europeana. So it was over three years, there was nine countries, 16 partners, and it was um, in the end created over 4,000 models. Um, it wasn't just about creating the data models, it was about thinking about the process, about how we went about getting to the end result. So there was obviously elements, a big element of it was data capture methods, but also in there there was the modelling phases, gathering appropriate and good quality metadata, Addressing the complex issues around licensing and then working out how on earth we get these very complex data sets out to the public through online delivery platforms. Um, our first job in Ireland was really good fun, it was to try and work out what we were going to digitise. We um, are a small organisation, the Discovery Programme, we have very limited budget, so any opportunity throughout we do field survey is something we, we grab at with both hands. So we worked from um, the obvious, which would be the World Heritage Sites in Ireland, um, that would be Skellig Michael and Bruna Boyne, but also looked at the sites which have been put on the proposed list, uh, potentially becoming World Heritage Sites. We had the Western Stone Forts, the monastic settlements, and then added a few other sites which we had access to data for, or we had a reason to perhaps go and survey, which would be the case with the city walls of Derry, where at the time it was... Um, uh, Derry was the uh, city of culture in the UK, so it was an opportunity to, to um, take on a big project like that. So we ended up with a, a fairly diverse set of, of sites, um, varying complexity, uh, varying challenges. But we could realistically gather them into three, uh, three groupings, or well, three overall groupings. So the landscapes, a um, particular set of challenges, buildings or um, structures and then the monuments themselves. So just have a quick look at how we then approach these different survey challenges. Um, obviously the landscapes, we would, um, whenever possible, we accessed existing LiDAR data sets, so it was repurposing LiDAR there. For the building surveys, we have uh, a laser scanner in the Discovery Program, Faro Focus, so we were out surveying that. And for monuments, um, this is where we're looking at trying to get the real detail, the, the precise um, elements of stone carvings, for instance, we use the handheld data gave us then. And you can see it's about accuracy, matching accuracy and resolution with the subject matter that you're um, about to record. Um, so if we look at an airborne laser scanning example, this is Skelly's Michael, um, where this data had been captured back in 2007. It was accessible to the discovery program, so it was really a relatively straightforward challenge then to model that data and provide ourselves with a, a nice um, 3D surface. And on this, um, you can see that the monastic settlement is already a relatively small part of the overall island. And you've got monastic settlement, and then there's also archaeology on the side peak. But what's really nice about this is it's allowing us to put the settlement in this landscape context. And that's a fairly dramatic site. I have to say, very unusually with LIDAR, you don't have to give it any vertical exaggeration. That's <laughs> what it I've also been very lucky. I've been out there the last ten, two years on regular occasions doing survey work on the island, so it's one of my absolute favourite places. And terrestrial, that's me terrestrial scanning there. On. The terrestrial scanning was probably the bulk of the work. It was um, recording upstanding buildings and, and, and monuments. 
and this is the pilot focus recording uh, intensity in RGBs. We're doing georeferencing um, with um, GPS, differential GPS. We're using the VRS now correction system. And these are the kind of results that we get back from the Tresto scanner. This example is from Jerry Walls, it's the Bishop's Gate there. This is point cloud data um, coloured with the RGB value from the scanner. Uh, this is um, Lendelof, St Kevin's Church with the, um, the, the right tower in the background. Uh, Unangus on Inishmoor, um, on the Western Stone Ports. It's, um, we've done about terrestrial laser scanning. I think it would really benefit from, from LiDAR data as well, because hidden at the back there is a steep cliff falling down into the Atlantic. So this is where sometimes I think the data that's available doesn't necessarily fulfil the, the overall challenge. So we may go back there and do some work with a drone that we've recently um, added to the survey equipment. And this is from Skelly Michael itself. We went back into terrestrial scanning. Obviously, if you just use the LiDAR data, the detail of the monument is not really good enough for architectural e examination. So we're back from Skelly Michael Skelly, uh, scanning the, the massive settlement down to far, far higher uh, resolution. The monument scanning is done using this Arte Davis scanner. It gets resolutions down to about half uh, a millimeter, which is good enough for stone carvings, um, such as uh, the, the High Crosses of Ireland. There's been a lot of work been done on that. Um, it's relatively straightforward, handheld. The only thing it does need is it has to be worked in a dark environment, which is meant as spending some time in in the dark in graveyards after after <laughs> nightfall. It's a bit of a strange job from time to time. But that's the kind of results that we get back. That's a bit dark. That's the raw data, really just processed different scans brought together in Geomagic. And we'll see that the, the challenge and what we've done with the data since then is, is improve the visualizations. And if it's scanned piece by piece, uh, we need access to mobile platforms and towers to get the best out of the data. So at the end of all this data capture, we end up with lots and lots of data, uh, very complex data sets, which are in themselves of great scientific value. So although 3D icons was about putting data out there for the public to access, it's really important to know that we, we've captured data which we can use for really solid scientific purposes. And we keep this data, and all the next phases are just about getting this data going down one path, which is dissemination, but holding that data for further scientific uh, purposes is very important. Uh, so these are some of the, the challenges in, in creating access to the models. Um, a number of a kind of wish lists there of things which we'd like to, to have the ability to see things on multiple platforms, uh, single release, and not requiring people to install software. And all of this really started to point to a, a gaming approach to solving the problem of getting data out there. And that was the path that the Discovery Program followed in, in this project. And this was the, after um, a lot of research done by um, 3D Modeler, who we brought into the Discovery Program, we realized that as surveyors, we didn't really have the skill base to do this. So we brought in somebody with a 3D modeling and gaming background. And working together, we came up with this this solution, which is, involves a number of stages there, but I think the, the really critical element, or the bit that's, that's pivotal to the, the whole thing, is this UV unwrapping idea. That's at stage four there. And what that does is it's, it's a little bit like when you have um, the globe and you have to pr put it on a flat page, you have to kind of unwrap it as a projection, and this UV is unwrapping three dimensional objects or, or buildings into a flat plane. What that allows us to do is take a low resolution version of the point cloud, unwrap that to give us this geometric framework, and then start painting back on the uh, more complex data, for, uh, which we've got um, normal maps or ambient occlusion visualization, or even the, gen the, the texture itself, and get that data, the, these really high resolution visualizations back onto the surface. And the next slide, I think, summarizes that a bit better. And the, key thing here is looking at these values, which might be difficult to read from the back. But if we start off with the original data, which was two gigabytes, we've ended up through going through that um, processing path down to two megabytes with that model that's on the screen there. So the contents and purposes to the user looking at it, they're seeing the quality and detail and the, um, the intricacy of the carving. Are they able to access that over any sort of browser, any platform, mobile platform, because it's such a small file size? 
there's just no way you can sell by data that's gigabytes. It's just not going to happen. So this, although this is a, um, a monument, it's working in the same way as the previous slide, and we're ending up with um, using this um, idea of UV unwrapping and then applying the visualization. Um, for accessing the models for uh, 3D Icons Europe project, one of the, the kind of entry level way we did this was to create turntable videos and upload videos of all the, the sites. It's not particularly interactive, but it gives people some kind of idea that the three dimensionality of what they're looking at and the quality of the, the data the models that are there. But a far better way um, of accessing it we found was using the Sketchfab um, utility or function. And we developed our own um, discovery program, Sketchfab account, and uploaded all of our um, models to, to Sketchfab. And this was to be the, the kind of solution for getting data from the surveys through the modeling and then out to web delivery. <coughs> these are just some enlargements here, the, the type of things that, that they look like. I should really have these as, as video models, but as they all seem to fail in presentations, these are just stills, unfortunately. Um, one of the things with, with Sketchfab, it's, it's something that's quite fluid. It's, it's being developed as it goes along, and, and the, the people operating Sketchfab have been quite close contact with the Discovery Program. They like the material we're putting up there, so we've given them feedback. And one of the things we're, we're trying to get them to put into Sketchfab is the ability to measure, um, to get measurements and to take um, values from the models. At the moment, they're a bit scaleless, and I think it'd be really nice if people could, could measure things in the model. The other thing we're doing is um, putting in these hotspots so the user can go in and click on the, the, the little um, numbers that are there. And it brings up menus with a bit more information about what they're seeing. Just got a few examples. That's the um, entrance stone here at Nouth. Actually, the previous sample was a site I looked to go to. I the White Island. Um, these figures on White Island and uh, Fermanagh and all these are pretty fantastic looking models. Uh, this is the entrance stone at Nouth modeled up. This is the Cross of the Scriptures, one of the, the finest of the high crosses from Tom McNoise. Uh, that's Palin Brown, we saw that earlier on actually, um, one of the previous presentations. Portal 2. And then for some reason, we've got White Island again. And um, Bishop's Gate would be the model of, you saw the point cloud of that data earlier on, that's the, the visualization of the, the scene for uh, Bishop's Gate. And this, we did the landscapes this way as well. We've got this, a, a small cut out there of the Chikong on the uh, Hill of Tara. So 3D Icons Europe, um, that was really the end of the project. It finished in January 2015. And the legacy of that is the website. It's content going into Europeana. So it's done the job it's set out to do. I think it was generally perceived to have been a very successful project. Um, it seemed to be well received. But we felt like there was more to come from the data. We felt like it was an opportunity really to, to do more with it. We put a lot of effort into gathering the data and we really wanted to, to get maximise the, the benefits back to the discovery program. So that's what I want to do now, just go through a few of the examples of how we we see this. Um, it's, it's something that's it's under development in many cases. There's, there are ideas coming through, there's feedback coming our way, and I think uh, there'll be a lot more to come. The first thing we did was we decided that the, the uh, 3D Icons Europe website and the end result of that just wasn't really doing justice to the material. So we decided to set up our own website, 3D Icons Ireland, uh, which was a dedicated website to the content that we created. Uh, we got the Minister for Arts Heritage Gale to Heather Humphreys. She launched the, the website for us in April 2015. We got quite a bit of publicity through that. We managed to get RT News to come and do a story with us. The Irish Times ran a story on it. And that really got the ball rolling, I think. It was quite significant that we managed to get that level of commitment from, from the Minister to, to help us get the ball rolling with the project. It's just a brief look. It's, it's a website. We've all seen lots of websites. I think it's worth just looking at the way, if you look at that screen now, when we talk about education in a few minutes, just remember how perhaps dull this looks. Um, but you can each side we have... Um, a description written by uh, staff at the Discovery Programme or with help from uh, the National Monuments Service, OPW. So each of the sites had a description to describe what's there. And then we've extracted a set of images from the 3D model. These have been formal elevations, um, 
and different angles. We'd have the oblique isometric views. And for each one, we'd have enlargements so that people can really see the level of detail that's in, in the carving or the stone in this case with the high cross. Then the website gives you access to the Sketchfab models. <coughs> You can go and access them to our website or you can go to um, Sketchfab directly. And obviously we, if we have um, different versions in Sketchfab, we'll have more than one model that's accessible. So this is like an example where we're using the, the hotspots and having the texture from um, photo imagery. Um, so I was saying that about that website went out and we kind of left it, in a sense it was left at that, we, we want to keep growing it, we want to have the opportunity to gather more. But we then um, found that uh, just by chance that this website had been picked up by, by some schools with interesting mm -hmm. applications. And um, one of the schools, it was, uh, it was the, the daughter of somebody we worked with through the OPW. He just happened to mention that her do uh, his daughter had been in the classroom and the teacher had actually been using 3D icons and he'd never heard of it and he wanted to know more about it. So we, we kind of followed that up, and it was a St. Wilson um, school in Selbridge, where a history teacher was simply using this, standing like I am, driving the menus, and using that as a teaching resource, because it tied in very closely with the, the junior certificate um, curriculum. So she was able to, when she was talking about a particular period in history, she could show them the examples on 3D icons. And we spoke to the teachers in the school and got quite a lot of feedback. One of the things was that the website for a junior cycle um, student was quite dry looking and, yeah, and would really um, benefit from a bit more lively approach. So uh, that was something we took back. And that they would like to have um, audio narratives instead of just written content. So they liked the idea that maybe we would record the, what the site was about. And so they just press a button and listen, listen to that. Well, St. Joseph at Rush, another application was, there was a slightly more odd one where an art teacher um, was asking the students to look at the website to get inspiration for creating their own pieces of artwork. So they were looking online. This is an example here of a, um, a clay version of the entrance stone at Newgrange, which had been made by a student having got the inspiration from, from the website. Um, so following, we, we have a, an outreach officer at the Discovery Programme. And she's been following this up really. She's been taking the lead to try and work with the schools and try and see how we can push this forward. So she's been attending meetings of uh, teachers' association <laughs> and trying to see whether there's a way that any of this material could actually be embedded into future curriculum development. Um, and this final education one is actually at third level where we were asked by the Department of History it's, uh, the Southeast Missouri State University, if they could have the STL files, these are the, the files which allow you to, to print these 3D print. So we thought as this was a one-off request, this made a lot of sense. So they took these STL files, then printed out their own 3D versions of selected um, elements of 3D icons, and used these to um, produce their own um, podcasts and, and such like to put a teaching <coughs> element together. Um, just moving through, the, this is the, the next level of, of, of in interest we had is been from tourism and particularly the idea of immersive experiences. Um, Ireland is, is always trying to push the, um, the cultural element as a, a tourism driver and tourism driver is very important to the economic recovery in Ireland. And the government has just launched a new initiative called Ireland's Ancient East. This is following on from a very successful um, tourism promotion well, the Wild Atlantic Way, which was more based on the um, natural environment of the west coast of Ireland. So having done that for the west, they had to come up with something for the east. So it was um, Ireland's ancient east. And the idea here is to kind of put a promotion of tourism together based on um, the heritage sites of the east of Ireland, which so happened to be quite well represented in the 3D icons catalogue that we've got so far. So what we've been doing really is, is kind of working with um, OPW to develop um, and improve a range of interpretive materials which will be placed on some of these sites, at the sites, maybe better boards. Perhaps trying to look at that mobile technology that we saw just before coffee, I think that would be a really nice way of bringing this um, to life and um, basically improve the visitor experience which can be quite disappointing on, on some of these uh, sites. And the other thing we've been working on with OPW is developing a virtual experience for Nouth. 
Um, unlike Newgrange, if you've been to Brunaboyne in Newgrange, you can join a tour and go inside the chamber and experience the thing firsthand. But now it's all you get is a tantalising glimpse as you look through the railings and can see that there's something really cool and exciting, but there's no way you're going to get in there. <laughs> um, you get put into a concrete bunker with some uh, information panels instead. So the OPW realised that this is something that they need to try and address, and we've been working with them. Um, basically taking the same processing ideas where you take a point cloud, you decimate it down, you put the nice textures on top of it, and then drop that into a games environment. And it's in the games environment that we've had the um, 3D modeler working to try and put together a, a Unity game, um, which will be something that will be placed either we'd obviously like to have it with headsets or something. I think the first phase will just be like PlayStation kind of application in the bunker that people will be able to experience what it's really like to go there. It is a brilliant place to visit. If I've been fortunate through through the icons to actually go in there and it's all crawling down your hands and knees and kind of a, a very great experience and you get into the chamber and it all sort of comes to life. This is just a short little video. I don't know how clear it is. It's obviously the idea of any of these environments is that you're looking around yourself with the video. You're just being driven there by um, Aaron who put this together. But you're going in, this is the sort of experience that we're trying to give people where they can see what's there, they can um, zoom in. It'll have sort of narratives possibly attached to it. And where there's detailed rock carving, you'll be able to get better um, visualizations of those and go and interrogate them in, in more detail. This is then. Um, what Aaron's been working on uh, at the Discovery Program. And this is supposed to go live at some point this year. Uh, the OPW hope to have it um, mouth opens again in, at Easter time. So it's not going to be there for its opening, but at some point during the year, they're hoping to, to bring this live. Um, commercialization, uh, to a certain extent, what we've just seen is commercialization because some of the promotion <coughs> there is being done by external contractors and they're actually being prepared to pay royalties to access the, the data that we have. So we're already seeing there's some sort of commercial um, benefits. But these are perhaps more, um, more deliberate and more obvious ones. And one of those would be um, the film board. Um, Ireland it likes to see itself as a, as a, a prime location for film, as film sets. It does, it does a lot of promoting, there's lots of tax breaks for companies to come and use Ireland as a, as, a pro, as a production base. So we arrange meetings with the Irish Film Board to basically just make them aware that this content is there. And it's a resource which can be used both in, in pre-production planning. If you have 3D data, you can plan your activities more cost effectively. And obviously in the future, um, post-production comes in for special effects. So we've been working with the Film Board trying to encourage them to use this as promotion. And the idea would be that if it's um, <coughs> any money raised from this comes back, that we would really just use that to reinvest in 3D icons and open more and more, uh, increase our library of material and sites that we have, and we just use that then. So it'd be a kind of perpetual cycle of, of, of the benefits to, to ourselves and benefits to the film producers who use it. And obviously in Ireland, we have had a lot of, um, of film activity recently, particularly Star Wars was using um, Skellig Michael as a film location in episode 7. And in advance of episode 7, they did approach us with a view to, to using the data. But J.J. Um, Abrahams decided he really wanted to go old school on episode 7, so he uh, tragically decided not to use our data. I'm really looking forward to seeing my name somewhere at the very end of the credits, but it wasn't to be. But we have been told there's a good chance that episode <coughs> 8, which is going back, is going to actually use the data so that they don't have to spend so much time on the island and it always causes <coughs> controversy when they're there. Mm -hmm. Game of Thrones would be another um, company that's expressed interest. So there really is a great opportunity, I think, for 3D data to have this kind of commercial activity and um, maybe allow us to do more of the scanning. And 3D printing, we've mentioned um, how we did some 3D printing with the, the college in America. We've also had approaches from the <coughs> printing companies who are, are quite happy to, if we'll allow it, to embed a little button <coughs> underneath each of our models, which they click on the button and that orders your 3D print. We would have absolutely nothing to do with it. Um, it would be passed directly over to the company. We would just get a small royalty for everything they sell. So it would be sort of something for nothing for us. So we're investigating that. We've had two or three companies have suggested that they'd be interested in doing that. Um, I suppose 
the other thing that we would have would be um, showcases where 3D printing companies have said that they've got a new technology, a new technique, and they want to showcase that. Can they have our data and they'll give us some money for um, or they give us money or they'll give us models that we can use to, to use in education purposes. So there's a lot there from 3D printing. Finally, it's very, very nearly there. Academic research. Um, this is a, a project that we've just started at Discovery Program called Digital Replica Project. Um, in this case, we are talking not about the models that you've seen online, I'm talking about going back the step to where I said that we archive all the high quality data. So we're working with the high quality data of the originals where we've scanned them, in this case the market cross at Kells, and then we're accessing replicas, whether that be the um, plasticast replicas, uh, Victorian plasticast replicas, and um, particularly where we get access to the molds that made those plasticasts, and we're going to scan those and do some deformation, uh, scan point, uh, cloud, cloud analysis, and see whether we can tell anything meaningful about the differences between them. Um, it's a challenging um, project. I think there's a number of um, reasons why things might be different. We mm -hmm. obviously thought we, the original ideas was things like erosion. If something's been left out for a hundred years, can you get some idea of how the weathering processes have affected it? But the more we look into it, the more complex it becomes because we're then learning that the moulds and the casts change over time as well. So we're going to have to do an awful lot of thinking, an awful lot of working out of what we're actually seeing. But it's an interesting idea. It's, it's a small part of a bigger project being run by, uh, in conjunction with UCD in, in Dublin and a student, Michael Ann Bevavino, who's doing a PhD in this research. So it's a nice idea, though, to go back to the original data and, and do something quite meaningful with it, I think. And that's it really, and um, these are just the people at the Discovery Programme who've got to uh, be mentioned really, <laughs> getting us to where we are. And the project that we were working on, um, 3D Icons, there was an incredible number of people who enabled that project to take place. I can't mention them all, but the, the OPW people who had got access to the sites and helped us when we were on site, an amazing number of people. And there's just some resources. I would just recommend you have a look at Sketchfab thing. You can look at it on your phone. Um, I was looking at it before I started the presentation. Uh, YouTube's there, and if you want to get in touch with me, that's my contact details. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.